this project too, of course, generally, and, and the project I'm working on with uh, Tammy Harvey and Mark Fleer here as well. Some of the questions, of course, that really focus our, our minds in terms of Brexit and health are those immediate questions, the firefighting questions, really, and indeed, whether we do, of course, end up falling off a cliff next March. Um, but also, more generally, intermediate questions. What needs to be fixed initially? But then what is an intermediate question of, of where we will be in our relationship with the EU and Im implications around that? And then longer term, where do we actually stand in this? And in terms of public health, this also relates to our broader question of relationship with global health law and external legal norms and organisations as well. Now, in some ways, perhaps, and it's really interesting in a sense, I think, public health has been perhaps the I don't know, surprising Cinderella in the Brexit debate, and perhaps understandably, because, of course, as we've seen, the first focus of the negotiations are inevitably around people and trying to <coughs> ensure and protect individuals' positions. But public health has been integral in terms of the way in which the EU has conceptualised and led to regulation over health, and it's there up in the treaty in Article 168 itself. And of course that question over keeping in law respect for those sort of public health norms in relation to that is something which I know is dear to the Faculty of Public Health's heart, the discussion of the Do Not Harm Amendment at the moment, and I shall leave that to John to go on to explain that further. It was alluded to in this morning's discussions. Um, some specific areas, of course, that might potentially be impacted on, by no means all of them, but just to flag a few. Smoking, of course, significant cause of death across the EU. The EU's had a really long involvement in the area. And this is an area, too, where we're talking about public health risks, public health challenges, and of course, individual autonomy too, but also the community's interest and the right to private life. And there have been tensions for years, of course, around regulation in this. The current directive in there here, the 2004 directive, was not uncontroversial. The EU has been regulating, as I said, for many years, and the 2014 directive regulates a whole range of issues to do with use and control of tobacco regulation. Now, of course, the withdrawal bill has the idea that it will pass on existing legal norms into English law and existing standards. As we'll come on to see, of course, some of the problems that will arise are in relation to both reciprocity and the immediate term, and the immediate questions, and also broader issues as to what happens around alignment in the longer term. Smoking, of course, can be seen as a a broader question in terms of health and an economic question as well, driving regulation in the area. But it's something too that it isn't just the EU, there's been a domestic commitment to the law in the area, the ban on smoking in public places, for instance a very successful example of public health policy as well. But the EU itself has been important if we see for example the recent regulation over e use of e-cigarettes and so on. Its involvement and importance cannot be <coughs> underestimated. Now, as I said, there are fears about this. There are fears, and I know in the public health community too, over the implications longer term once we become a third country and our ability and status to withhold and withstand lobbying, for example, around this, commercial pressures. But also there's alignment with regulatory norms in the future. Other issues, so safety, blood safety, organs, tissue safety. Something the EU's made it on, of course, contaminated blood, the scandals around that, of course, we're revisiting again in this country, going back and going over in terms of recent inquiries in this area. Now, these raise questions, of course, of cross-border. And as well as that, too, that we're dealing with an area that's not simply EU regulated. Yes, there are forms of EU regulation in this area, there are a number of directives, but in addition to that, there is also domestic law operating alongside it. It's not totally sort of regulatory capture of a particular area. But there are common standards of quality and of safety. There are implications in terms of designation establishments, accreditation, clinical selection of donors, etc. And also of the role of the competent authority. We'll come back to this when we look at the regulation of pharmaceuticals in the next session. It's a common sort of EU regulatory tool. But also something else that's common across pharma reg is those questions of, of safety, vigilance questions. We are participating in a number of databases that enable information to be passed on about safety concerns across Europe. And what happens to those post-Brexit? Now, this is where Article 7 of the draft uh, withdrawal agreement is really interesting, because this is the, we're going to switch the lights off type provision. 
and it basically is going to cut us out of computerized databases, which we are participations, participants in at the present time. And this would presumably include any existing participation in alert systems, pharmacovigilance systems, and so on, once we leave, whenever, you know, when that date specifically is. Also, too, so safety questions there are very much part of this area. The reporting systems in relation to organ donation, I'm conscious of time. Um, tracking and tracing is a big issue uh, in this area. Cells, tissues and cells are going to have to have a single identifiable code added to them. Um, and this is going to be added on to yet another EU database that's come into, into operation as well. This is an area, too, that's underpinned by human rights considerations. Of course, we're departing from the Charter of Fundamental Rights, but this, too, has provisions relevant here. Provisions in relation to consent, provisions in relation to non-commodification of human material. And it's important to ensure that those provisions themselves, at least in the spirit of them, is continued after Brexit. There are also, of course, the involvement in communicable disease control. The European Centre for Disease Control we're in, is an EU agency. We're, we have obviously links to that as being EU member states. Its role, of course, will be departing from that once we actually leave as well. Now, this, of course, is a question raised in the Manchester House speech of the access to EU agencies post-Brexit and that question of sectoral deals. And moreover, indeed, of course, how realistic is that actually? And certainly the message that's coming from the EU suggests that sectoral deals may not be certainly the way it's going to go. So <coughs> what then happens really, you know, post-Brexit itself? Do we lose access to all this? Provisions for tracking and tracing, safety systems as well? Or do we have an agreement? And moreover, what about the long-term alignment in this sort of area? EU law continually is evolving. We've got regulation of tissue and cells being looked at again at the moment by the EU. But two, there's also the other point about losing voice losing participation in EU agencies, ethical bodies, as well as some of the other big EU agencies, too. So first of all, the impact on the NHS. I'm, I'm sure you've already heard today about the, first of all, the massive impact on, on staff. We're seeing the EU, we, we, have, we have already uh, a workforce crisis in the NHS. I, um, as well as being a practicing GP, I, I also sit on the health select committee and we've recently looked at, at nursing workforce 11 percent of nurse posts are currently vacant where we're struggling to retain many of the nurses that go even go into training there's a there's a 30 percent attrition rate for many student nurses um, yet we're seeing <coughs> we've plugged gaps by by bringing nurses in from EU countries, and the number of nurses from EU countries has significantly increased over the last 10 years. Surprise, surprise, after our decision to leave the EU, we're seeing a reduction in the number of people coming and an increase in the number of people who are leaving. And, and we've, we've just started to see that change, and it's very likely, and certainly the, the word on the, on the ground is that many people feel that they're just not welcome here anymore, and many other people are are worried about what rights they might have as EU citizens in this country. Despite the rhetoric from the government, messages aren't getting through to the front line. So there's a big crisis in, um, there, there are, there are um, many doctors from EU countries that have either made plans to leave or are thinking about leaving. <coughs> big problems with midwif midwives who are leaving. And so these are shortage occupations <coughs> where we're really struggling. There's also a big impact on NHS finance as um, you, we heard the, the spring statement from the Chancellor yesterday, and I think one of the big reasons why the Chancellor isn't able to put the, clearly the extra money that is needed into the NHS and social care at the moment is because of the uncertain economic consequences of our exit from the European Union. Um, and of course, if we have reduced GDP growth, then there will be um, increased population growth um, less growth in GDP and, um, and there will be less money to spend on, um, on the NHS. The third big area, um, an area that we've been looking at in the select committee that we're going to um, release a report on hopefully within the next week or two, um, is the area that, that you've just touched on um, around medicines, medical devices, research and our, um, our medicines industry, our medical devices industry is a, 
um, is, a pan, is pan-European. We, we've been part of the European Medicines Agency for regulation of medicines. But we, by ourselves, represent only 3% of the global market. <coughs> together with Europe, we represent only 25%. So we were stronger and uh, together. And drug companies had will, will undoubtedly prioritise getting new drugs to the market in the rest of Europe ahead of, uh, ahead of the UK. Uh, and, and I think they're... People are very worried about what, what a, a future customs deal might look like, um, the impact of having different regulatory regimes and, um, and the uncertainty that this is all bringing. And so what we're seeing is that, and this will have an impact on public health, we, um, we were told in the select committee that a drug company had, had recently, a pharmaceutical company, had spent more than £70 million preparing for the contingency of a no-deal Brexit by... Um, by building their resources in other parts of Europe. Um, and that's money that they should have been spending, developing, um, and they said that the opportunity cost of that was, um, w was likely to have been spent on cancer research. And of course the fourth threat, I suppose, for the, um, for the NHS is the, is the price of a trade deal. We're, um, we are looking for free trade deals and we are going to have to negotiate with, um, particularly with Trump's United States, and we do not know and the government are not ruling out the, um, the possibility of having to trade increased access to the NHS for US companies and um, particularly, I think, perhaps the chance of US pharmaceutical companies being able to market directly to the public in the, in the United <coughs> Kingdom as they do in the US. So they're, they're all, they are all threats that I think together, any one of those perhaps um, would be a big threat to an NHS or, or already under strain, but all of those areas together I think provide a larger threat. The, um, the second area that I want to touch on is around the, the general economic effect. Um, I represent a constituency in the northeast of England, and we, um, we saw from the government's own economic analysis that, the, um, that the, the lost GDP growth that there's likely to be, certainly in the event of, um, of a no-deal Brexit, would be 16% lost GDP growth. Even with the government's preferred bespoke trade deal, there's going to be um, over the next 30 years, an 11% loss of, of GDP growth. Um, although if we stayed in the single market and customs union, that would be brought down to a 2% loss, according to the government's own figures. And we, we all know that, these are, um, that there, there is a certain unreliability about predictions, but these are the best figures that the government has come up with by itself. It's no coincidence, though, that the northeast of England is an area that um, where there are significant health inequalities, not just between the northeast of England and the rest of the country. Life expectancy is lower in the north of England than it is in the south, but also the, there are significant health inequalities within places um, in Stockton, the town that I represent. The, the life expectancy gap for, for men in the richest parts of the, uh, of the town compared to the poorest parts of the town is a 15-year difference in life expectancy. And, um, and I think poverty plays, and the economy plays a very large part in that, and it's likely to be some of the poorest parts of the country that are likely to, to, to lose the potential for the most amount of economic growth as a result of leaving the EU, largely because our economies are... Um, are tied to manufacturing as well as um, services that we provide to the rest of Europe and our <coughs> departure from the EU, particularly on a no-deal Brexit, and if we get the wrong deal, will we'll have a, a, a hit to our, to our economies. Um, and it possibly won't have such a big, a big impact on some of the more affluent areas of this country. And I think that's a, that's a, um, a you know, we, we know that health is, is strongly tied to, um, to wealth. We have seen, uh, you know, unparalleled increases in human life expectancy over the last 20 or 30 years, but they have plateaued and they're starting to reduce. Um, and I think it is the, you know, we, the, the impact of Brexit on our, on our economy is certainly not going to help that and potentially threatens that. And the final thing I'd like to talk about, if I may, is, is opportunity cost. Um, I found myself um, uh, elected as a member of Parliament uh, uh, only 10 months ago. And... Um, I have a passion for politics. I've seen in my life, in my career, working both in the, um, in the UK in disadvan with disadvantaged communities, but also internationally, the, the difference that political change can make to people's lives, to people's health. Um, the, the really sad thing about the time that I found myself in Parliament is that 
Um, our entire political infrastructure, our civil service, all of our politicians are spending all of their time concentrating on the mitigating against the impact of our decision to leave the European Union. It's a harm minimization exercise. And I would love us to be talking about the first thousand and one days of life and what we could be doing in order to really improve brain development in, in children in pregnancy and in the first couple of years after birth in order to try to reduce some of the causes of the causes of health inequalities. Um, I'd love us to be looking at, at what we can do to improve housing, what we can do to bring jobs and skills and all of these other things that affect the, the social determinants of health. I'd love us to be looking at marginalised communities and, um, and what we can do to improve their health. But instead we're spending our time talking about trying to mitigate against damage um, made by what I feel is, um, is, is a, a reckless decision that our country has made in order to go into the unknown and, and leave, what, leave a, 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 a system that is, certainly from the point of view of public health and the point of view of the NHS, a system that, that is working uh, and, has, and, has, and has worked well for a long period of time. It doesn't have to be this way. The, um, particularly the decisions around leaving the single market and the customs union seem to be the ones that are the most harmful. They're political choices that are being made by the current government and it doesn't necessarily follow from the referendum result that we have to be leaving the, the single market and customs union. And the final thing that I want to say to you is that members of parliament will have a say on the final deal in October. Um, and I think there's an increasing body of people that say that um, the public, if it looks as though we're going to be getting a bad deal as a result of us leaving, that the public should also have their say on the final deal that we get with the EU. Thank you. The UK Faculty of Public Health was one of the few colleges or faculties uh, that did come out with any kind of statement before the referendum. We uh, said that uh, we thought it was a bad, uh, it would be a bad decision for health. Uh, and uh, although we were challenged by the Charities Commission, they accepted that this was not a party political statement and was uh, within our professional uh, purview to, to say that. Um, since the referendum, we have been uh, concentrating our activities in areas where we don't feel other aspects of the health system uh, will pick up. So. You know, we recognise, as the discussion this morning, the uh, issue of where we get our workforce from, uh, threats to research, all of those things are extremely important and uh, you know, being covered fairly extensively, I think, through other organisations, including uh, the Brexit Health Alliance that, that we are part of. Um, so our efforts, from a long list of about 14 or 15, uh, including things like uh, the impacts on inequalities in health, either um, directly through damage to local economies or um, equally directly through loss of grants from the EU. Uh, that's something which local <coughs> government association and others are picking up quite strongly. Um, we, uh, uh, we've alighted on three big areas that we think are important. Um, Jean and, and, uh, and Tammy and uh, uh, Martin alluded to the no, do no harm uh, clause that we're uh, supporting uh, through uh, as an amendment in the House of Lords, possibly even as we speak. Um, the amendment that uh, Lord Warner is, is taking forward with a, a cross-party uh, group of uh, uh, Lords, peers, um, <coughs> why is it so important? It, uh, um, is it just symbolic to ask for a a high level of public health protection uh, in all our policies. Um, well, I might have thought it was symbolic at one point. It's certainly uh, an elegant uh, amendment. It's only about four, four lines long, um, but it calls on all ministers of the Crown and others in public authority uh, to consider a high level of public protection in all of the policies and activities uh, that they pursue. It's not just about the NHS, it could be a housing minister, it could be transport, it could be agriculture, uh, and it's not just about government, it's about uh, not just about national government, it's about local government, 
uh, and it very much is that principle of health through all policies. Um, but uh, again, as I said this morning, it also um, is precise wording out of the Lisbon Treaty. Um, and this, for me, is where it's really important, because there is case law around that. Um, and I should say we're extremely grateful to uh, uh, Tamara and, uh, and Martin for putting the wording together for us. Uh, and, the, um, and for me, it, it's not just symbolic, because it is about rights. Uh, and um, you know the recent plain, plain packaging uh, uh, High Court uh, ruling uh, said our right to health is a higher level of right uh, than the tobacco industry's right to intellectual property. Uh, and it seems to me that this idea that enshrined in our uh, rights is something that can be tested in law uh, makes it absolutely crucial to me. Uh, I don't know if the lawyers of Philip Morris can come back in a year's time and say, we've removed all your European existing rights, we'll have another go at that law, we'll, 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 we'll challenge this uh, uh, no smoking in public places. You know, even if it was just annoyance, you know, they, they have hundreds of lawyers who can look at this kind of stuff. So for me, it's very important that we have a basis for all of the public health laws that we've had uh, since 1992. Um, another area that we've said is uh, uh, crucial to us as a public health community, um, some of the institutions that Europe, uh, the European Union has developed over the years. Um, we're using the specific example of the uh, European uh, Centre for Communicable Disease Surveillance. Um, we are a, a leading player in this. It's not uh, simply a case of you know, being one of the club. It, it is part of a very important protective net network uh, for early warning and surveillance uh, and identifying problems of communicable disease specifically, um, and, but also in emergency preparedness, in training. Uh, we're already seeing that uh, UK uh, registrars in public health are not being allowed onto the field epidemiology uh, training scheme because by the time they finish it will be outside of uh, the EU. Um, so we are working with Public Health England um, to make the case both to government about why we should stay in and pay the fees uh, and also to Europe about what we've got to offer uh, in that area of work. Uh, and there are numerous other uh, institutions that we also uh, need for the public's health. Uh, we know about the European Medicines Agency, uh, very important for us in public health, for, uh, particularly for vaccine, new vaccines approval. Um, the um, European Centre for uh, Drugs uh, Monitoring in Lisbon, which uh, follows and predicts and models uh, where illicit drug use is and what kinds of drugs uh, our agencies need to deal with. Um, and many more, of course, European uh, Environment Agency, Food Standards, uh, and so on. So that is the second area that we're looking at. And then with a more strategic uh, view in mind, uh, looking at the trade deals that, that we're likely to see in the future. Um, we had a bit of practice with the uh, uh, Transatlantic Trade uh, Investment Partnership um, and we all learned words like ISDS that we didn't know existed and uh, um, you know we all um, got a hell of a lot more knowledgeable about some of the uh, some of the non-financial aspects of trade deals uh, which particularly our uh, uh, the, the multinationals would like to dispense with the things that do uh, protect our health uh, across the world, actually. Uh, some of those about um, minimum wage, some about workplace conditions, some about the quality of consumer goods, uh, all the things that we have built up and held, held dear in the European Union, uh, or almost now things that we'll have to reinvent uh, if, we, uh, if, we, if we don't hang on to uh, some of that collective knowledge. The risk 
if the country takes the divergence approach that we want to, after whatever deal we may or may not, I mean, this is all hypothetical, isn't it, but whatever deal we may or may not get, a, a future government under Mr. Corbyn or someone else um, may decide they want to take a different approach. And I just wonder what the three of you think the consequences of doing that, given the landscape that you've set out to us, what, 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 what could that look like for the country? What are the dangers? It was certainly in terms of, yeah, it's working, isn't it? In terms of pretend, pretend, what these systems are set up to do is reduce risk, avoid harm, and, and where issues arise to let information about those be easily transmitted across jurisdictions to stop a, another major you know, pan-European contaminated blood scandal or whatever. Yeah. Um, and recognising as well that well, as we said, I think I said before, disease does, you know, is no respecter of borders. So that unless we have those sort of measures in place, then there is a risk that, to a domestic level, that these sort of things simply aren't picked up quick enough, that information's not transferred out there, uh, and isolationism in that sort of way is potentially very dangerous to health. Yeah. And there's also a cost. If we try to, to set up our own systems rather than pooling the cost and sharing it with... Um, with other people, then it's um, it's going to be more expensive for us. And we, it, I mean, it makes sense to um, to to ally with others. But um, and I, to me, it makes most sense to to form an allegiance and to form common systems and, and convergence with your closest geographical neighbours. But it would be possible for us to converge in terms of research and in terms of um, medicines regulation with with other areas and you know the the most natural other area I suppose would be the United States or Canada um, but I don't it's possible but I don't know that it is desirable um, and what it, it but it may be better to do that than to go alone completely um, I mean just by example with with food um, the EU has got 130 separate agreements with different countries over food safety standards so, you know, collectively that has assured the food coming from international sources into the European Union. Um, we have no sense that our government is going to negotiate uh, 130 separate agreements of their own. Um, presumably we'd, we'd, we'd adopt them and, I don't know, under <laughs> licence or what, but, you know, um, these things do exist, as Jean says, for, for a reason. They, 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 they are better done collectively and they've, they've served us pretty well, apart from the odd horse gate scandal. But, uh, yeah. uh, 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 Paul, do you, do you, politically, what, what is the uh, mood like in Parliament in terms of um, divergence versus... Uh, uh, Theresa May has said she wants to pay some money for associate membership of some of these organisations and bodies and maybe databases, etc. Uh, when it comes to Parliament, are there... Are MPs broadly, in, in your view, uh, in support of that, or, or is there a, uh, depending on which side of the house you're in, is there an, ap an appetite for actually going our own way, doing our own thing, spending our own money? No, there's a political minority that want to go our own way, and I think the vast majority of MPs would, um, and if there were a free vote, then I suspect that the vast majority of MPs would want to, um, to stay in um, as members of or as associate members of of both of all of the, the institutions, or most of the institutions that we're currently members of, um, and probably would want to stay as members of or associate members of the customs union and single market. But I'm, I'm learning about politics that, um, that the, um, the political parties are not necessarily take, um, following those, um, those lines, and, um, and there's very unlikely to be a free vote, and um, it's, it's more, so it's more complex than the the individual wishes of individual MPs. So the mood in Parliament is certainly one for, 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 for keeping things as closely aligned as, as possible. But whether that... Uh, the, one of the problems is that the EU has said no sector-by-sector -sector deals. And, and so even though there is a, a really, really strong case in the health sector for having convergence, for having really close alignment, or, or even for staying part of... Um, the the um, the organisations that we're part of, um, 
from the EU's negotiating perspective, if we do that, then we have to stay part of everything. And, and I suppose one of the arguments that we should be making is that, um, is that maybe, we, maybe we do need to press for sector by sector deals. Yeah. But, but we do have a strong card to play, don't we, Jean, in, in the fact that the England, the NHS, our, our approach to health is quite um, renowned. We're, we're world leaders, are we not, in, in some regards to this, and that it would be in the EU's interest as well as ours to maintain cooperation or...? Well, I think that's a, well, that's a big question, isn't it? <laughs> Whether really that will be put in the way. I mean, the EU may say itself in terms of, I mean, from the developments from the Commission in terms of you know, public health itself, that things have been fairly well structured from their perspective, fairly well organised, and that, yes, it would be seen as a loss in terms of losing those links, but that ultimately there are a large number of other European countries out there, yeah. and that we may end up being as a result of that just cut off. Is that, is that, that your view, John? Um, yeah, well, that's the that's that's the, the the worst case scenario. I think I, I think there is uh, th there are a lot of uh, areas of work, not least in, in science and uh, uh, and, the, and in governance. You know, a lot of this European law came from British British sources. You know, I mean, it's uh, you know, so there are a lot of people who do still look to us for. Um, you know, they want to be involved with what we do. Um, what, why they are at the at the moment, I'm not sure. But um, you know, so um, certainly in the public health field, um, you know, we are engaged in a number of collaborations, and, and people want more of us. Um, but um, but certainly, you know, we are throwing up every obstacle to make it difficult. That's for sure. <laughs> the whole issue we're fighting about at the moment with a power grab is if you look at what they are a lot of the danger is around trade deals. Paul talked about it, the potential, obviously, of American companies, uh, you know, kind of coming into the NHS, direct selling, changing from the precautionary principle to the proof of harm principle, etc. So, uh, to me, the whole issue, they need a trade deal. What does the UK have to offer? Oh, you can sell American whiskey as scotch and you can have your hands on our NHS. And I think we need to recognise that trade deals is actually one of the biggest threats to things like uh, the NHS and public health, yeah. and to be concerned about that. I mean, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, with with the um, the transatlantic trade uh, investment partnership, we looked at uh, a whole raft of these things. I mean, the the, the iconic image is is the chlorine soaked chicken, but uh, um, you know the. Um, and, and the, the investor state dis, dispute um, system that allows uh, clandestine international uh, corporate lawyers to decide whether a country should be punished for putting in a, a minimum wage for Veolia's workers in Egypt or um, whether Ecuador should be punished for taking away mineral excavation rights uh, from a big American multinational, whether Quebec should be punished for uh, stopping fracking. You know, these are all things that come into international trade uh, agreements and, and, and trade law, and uh, we need to be very, very cautious. I mean, if, if we said, um, you know, if we'd only just gone to uh, uh, no smoking in public, you know, would that be a a, 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 a damage to the commercial interests of tobacco companies? Yeah, of course it would. That's what it's for. Um, you know, so when we're talking about protecting health, you know, we do have to understand that many times these will uh, be not in the corporate interests of, uh, um, of, of, of big multinational companies. And uh, similarly within the NHS, you know, I mean, the, the you know, we've... Um, we, we've had a big discussion of that this morning. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the opening up of the NHS to, to more corporate business uh, puts us into, into huge risks uh, as, as local government is now experiencing with all the contracts they're having to take back from the private sector. So, you know, um, these are major risks that could tie us up with huge bills for lawyers in, in all directions. Uh, and not get us the, the kind of services that we want and, and we need. Paul, could you uh, perhaps answer that lady's question around the meaningful vote? I, I presume yeah. you're in full favour of uh, such a 
uh, a vote. So Parliament has already um, voted to have a, and we, you know, the Prime Minister has promised that we're going to have a meaningful vote, and it's going to be, it's going to be an act of Parliament so that will be enacted in order to, um, to approve or reject the final deal. Um, there are, there are a couple of issues behind that, though. We don't, we don't know how much detail the final deal will be in by the time that we're likely to have to vote. Um, and actually, all European parliaments are going to have to vote on the final deal. And for that, for that timetable to, um, to, to, to actually then give everybody enough time to then put in place the deal for, for, us, to, for us to leave, we think that's going to have to be in October. Um, but the direct answer to your question is that the actual vote won't give the what um, will probably be to accept or reject. <coughs> but, but we there will be the opportunity to lay down amendments, and and that's at a time where there might be the chance to build cross-party consensus. You'd like to come back on something? I, I just want to, cut, to make a point of clarification yeah. that the, the withdrawal agreement under Article 50 does not require the agreement of all European parliaments. Okay, We're talking about the future UK-EU right. relationship, which potentially will, depending on whether it falls within the scope of European Union exclusive competence. That there's lots of legal technicalities. This, this was points that were being made this morning, that the European Union cannot act outside of its constitutional constraints. And it, I think there's quite a lot of muddle between deal and no deal. That we're talking about more than one agreement here. The withdrawal agreement has one procedure, mm. the future trade agreement and any other future agreements that we might have about anything else, how we collaborate over research, how we, you know, all of those things might be completely different legal instruments and they will all have different legal rules about how the EU must negotiate them. And, and we need to come to the negotiating table with a clear idea of those things in our minds, otherwise we're not going to be effective Negotiators. But thank you for your honesty and your answer to my actual question, which is that our parliament is not going to have a meaningful vote in the sense that the British public would think of it, i.e. stay in the EU, leave the EU with no agreement, or have the agreement that's on the table. Mm. That's what, if you asked your, your electorate mm. what do they think a meaningful vote would be, yeah. that's what they would say, and that is not on the table. Uh, th that's an interesting point, uh, and j just sort of following up on that, uh, are you in favour of some of the attempts in Parliament at the moment to to bind the Prime Minister's hands in terms of uh, what she can uh, manage to negotiate and vote for, what has to be included? Because there has been some talk of amendments in, in, in the Commons and in the Lords of effectively binding her to certain things, the Customs Union and others, yeah. which would... Yeah. If she loses that such a vote, would I mean they've delayed it, haven't they? But they, if that was to succeed, you, the prime minister could fall, the government could fall, etc. But, but do you see a benefit to that kind of approach? Uh, no, we have a fixed-term parliament act, and so just because the prime minister loses a vote doesn't mean that the government's going to fall. And I think we have to we have to separate that um, completely. I think the you know par we people voted to take back control, and it's parliament, not government, that should be sovereign. And I think Parliament does have, does, certainly has the right to, to mandate the Prime Minister to go into negotiations with certain negotiating objectives. And that will, that will not mean the end of the government. That will just mean that the government has to follow the will of Parliament. Because let's face it, many of, m much government policy at the moment is being dictated by a relatively small group of backbench <coughs> Conservative members of Parliament, the, um, the, who are called the ERG, ERG yeah. the European Research Group. Um, uh, and, um, and it should be the whole of Parliament that has the opportunity to, to, to ask the Prime Minister to behave in a certain way rather than her being held hostage by a small group of her backbenchers. Mm. May I answer the other question at the back? Yes, as well? sir, yeah, um, of course. I'm sorry, you didn't, I didn't catch your name, but you asked about the, um, the, the, the probability of a trade deal with the US, including direct selling, and, um, and then what the consequences or the impact of that might be. I have no idea about the probability because the government is, um, whenever we ask them about it, they turn to sound bites and they use the sound bites, the NHS is not for sale. Um, but they don't say anything more than the NHS is not for sale. And um, there have been questions from Labour, from the Liberal Democrats and from the SNP directly about this. And we always just get the same sound bite back. So we don't know what the likelihood is, but we are suspicious that there are negotiations taking place behind the scenes. I think the impact would be that um, 
the, it would change, I mean, the companies would be trying to change people's behaviour, and they'd be trying to change people's behaviour to get them to use more medicines, um, which, with a finite NHS resource, will be taking money away from prevention and towards treatment, and that's not the direction of travel that I think we should be following. Uh, and, um, and I think, you know, the, we, we see how, how much more costly the US health system is, and lar largely that's because of a lot of the way in which the pharmaceutical industry and how um, incentives for, for treatment, for doing stuff are there, rather than um, rather the, uh, the incentives for preventing ill health. Um, and actually, even though the United States spends almost double what we spend on, on, on health care uh, as, as a proportion of their GDP, their outcomes are worse. Than ours, yeah. and so I think that I think it would be a very negative consequence. You mentioned about the possibility of um, the dangers, the risks of preventative um, health interventions. Um, how could we re reframe the agenda, maybe, so that preventative health is put in the foreground and taken forward? Thanks. Okay, and do we have one more? We can. Uh, test out, or no? You're, you're all thinking about it, so that's uh, fair enough. Okay, um, John, can I ask you about the the second one? Re reforming the agenda, putting preventative health. How can we put that more front and centre? Well, um, uh, alongside our Brexit uh, campaign work, we are looking. Uh, uh, we have another campaign around uh, valuing public health. Uh, making the case for the strategic case for investment in prevention be it through uh, legislation through taxation through local services uh, and uh, we also uh, want to see the nhs uh, playing a much stronger role in prevention this is england i'm talking about now i, I do apologize um, but um, the um, the, the, the split of, of public health from lo uh, local government from the NHS uh, has created uh, difficulties in uh, people working together in, in things which, you know, if, w health budgets should just fund, basically. So we are looking in England to work on that front. We're working with Scottish colleagues on the, the reforms uh, that are being proposed uh, in Scotland. Uh, and in Northern Ireland and Wales, we are also uh, working alongside them as well. The, the, the strategic case for prevention is very strong. Um, it, the return on investments are all very, very favourable to investing in, in prevention and public health. What we now have to do is get the, uh, the practical in, uh, interventions, the practical changes uh, that make investment in prevention in any system uh, the valued and the right thing to do. Um, we're also, uh, you know, and it's not just pure prevention of people becoming ill. There is a lot that we fail to do in all of our health service provision to provide systematic care for people who've got long-term conditions. You know, these are all things where a secondary preventive approach, you know, can uh, keep people healthier for longer. So that, that's all part of, of our approach uh, to um, bringing prevention a much higher up the agenda. Um, it also relates to the uh, ACO question, if I may, uh, Sean. Yeah, feel free. Um, the, um, our, we, we, the position that um, my faculty has had, we, we opposed the Health and Social Care Act. Um, we. Um, we uh, paid somewhat dearly, some might say, for doing that. Um, but um, we, um, our members are uh, keen that we use the, uh, the new initiatives that uh, Simon Stevens seems to be taking to, to um, uh, work around the problems of the Health and Social Care Act. Um, integrated care is one of the essentials of what we, what we need. Um, and uh, we need it integrated at a commissioning level, uh, at a provision level, um, and we need far more uh, uh, investment in prevention and also in social care and housing, I would say. Um, but in regard to, um, to the ACOs as, as planned, um, I, I can only express a, a personal position on that. Uh, I think um, 
you know, people have stretched uh, the workarounds as far as they can go, and it feels to me that uh, some legislation has got to got to come in uh, to change the uh, change the position we're in because. You know, Simon Stevens may have a generous idea of what the NHS should be, uh, but Virgin Healthcare and the other uh, people out there uh, will will use the Health and Social Care Act because that's what it is. Mm. Uh, Jean, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I just, I just link to that. Of course, I mean, the, my understanding is that the actual uh, legal challenges being brought isn't it by Alice and Pollock and others. Yes. Actually, into the status of accountable care organisations. I'm not sure precisely where the action has gone up to. But I mean, I know the Health Select Committee itself is, is looking into this. I think you've got Chris Ham as an advisor, and so you're in a better position in terms of where you are in, in relation to that inquiry. Um, and it is something which is a it's a controversial and, and potentially divisive point as to how, on one hand, whether this is a benign issue, or on the other hand, whether by structuring areas of the country in this way, it would provide more fertile ground for private sector involvement. Uh, and certainly that we know that Pricewaterhouse and others sent teams out to look at the Valencia model, which is the, the analogous <coughs> model um, in operation this many years ago, actually, before mm. this was originally muted. So the arguments have been placed on both sides. I know mean, the committee it's, is looking into it. Then. But it is interesting. I mean, at the Health Service Journal, we've probably written more about ACOs and ICSs, as they're going to be called now, than anybody else. And the, there is an interesting sort of um, thought process in the NHS at the moment from senior NHS leaders who for a long time have said the Health and Social Care Act was the biggest disaster to hit the NHS for quite some time and Simon Stevens is trying to manoeuvre his way as best he can around that le legislation to get away from competition and private sector involvement in the NHS and yet he finds himself dragged to, to the High Court for a judicial review accusing him of trying to privatise the NHS and I have to say from our perspective at the journal speaking to NHS leaders is nothing, it's, it's completely the opposite of privatisation. The idea is further collaboration so that local NHS trusts work together on solutions rather than uh, against each other. And in terms of Virgin Care coming in and running the ACO, you only have to look at the amount of money they might get for running an A&E department to realise that they, they wouldn't want to go anywhere near uh, taking over those kinds of services. What Virgin want to do is cherry pick um, they want to the, the very expensive elective outpatient kind of work. They don't want to run an A&E department, but under an ACO model, they may be responsible for the whole thing. So I'm not quite sure if the privatise privatisation argument works myself. I think we've yet to see how this plays out, but a little soliloquy from me there, just uh, uh, putting down my chairman's hat for a while. But Paul, I'm very keen to get, bring you in on this, because clearly you'll have a, a, a view from the Health Select Committee. I know sure. you've been doing some work. Yeah, we need to be clear about the terminology here. Um, ICSs are integrated care systems. They are not being put out to procurement. They don't require any different legislation. They are about um, existing organisations working more closely with each other through voluntary agreements. And there is some brilliant work taking place, breaking down barriers between organisations. There are some some, still some significant obstacles, um, that are, one of which is the sharing of data, and, and the other of which is the 2012 Health and Social Care Act, and, um, and I would argue very strongly that repeal of Section 75 of the Health and Social Care Act would, would help all of this, um, but I think ICSs are happening, they are, um, and there are, some, there are some great examples throughout um, throughout this country, uh, of, um, and actually we're, we're only doing what many organisations in Scotland are, have been doing for quite a long time, we're following the lead uh, that Scotland has taken. Um, ACOs, Council Care Organisations, are new organisations, and there is a proposal to form these new organisations, and actually taking evidence on the, on the committee from the people that are interested in setting up these organisations. At the moment, they're only interested in setting up out-of-hospital care organisations, so it wouldn't include hospitals, but they're talking about having single organisations that bring together all of out-of-hospital care services, including social care, including general practice, including community nursing services. Now, in itself, I think that that is a good thing. Um, I would strongly advocate that there is far too much fragmentation in out-of-hospital care services. But again, I think they should be 
And then this is perhaps where legislation might be needed, because I think if they're going to be set up, they should be NHS organisations, um, and we should be you know, even working to find a way in which we could bring general practice into the NHS um, in order to kind of complete the whole picture of the NHS rather than the private sector organisations. So there will be a need. If these organisations, which I think are generally a good thing, do get set up, um, my view at the moment, and the committee hasn't yet formed a view on, on it, we're, we're still taking evidence, but my personal view at the moment is that there should be legislation around making them NHS organisations and we can, we can stop this being um, controversial at a single stroke of a pen uh, and I suspect that if this, and this is the link to Brexit, if there were legislation taken into Parliament to repeal <laughs> Section 75 of the Health and Social Care Act, I suspect it would command widespread support, but because our timetable is chock-a-block with bills around customs and around trade deals and around our exit from the European Union, we're told that there isn't time on the parliamentary timetable in order to get that kind of legislation on the statute book. It's interesting, going back to your comment at the beginning about the opportunity cost of Brexit, uh, there are so many things that the NHS needs legislation for, but the government won't bring it to the floor. Um, but there we go. Can I just bring you back to the point by, made at the back there about putting public health, uh, preventive oh, sorry, health yeah, on the I agenda? I idea around that as well. Because yeah. I also know that the health committee at the time were very critical of George Osborne when he removed £200 million from uh, Public Health England's budget and redrew the ring fence of NHS funding. Uh, so in a sense, it's been a bit of a Cinderella service. Uh, and. and I, I think yeah. your view so you asked about you asked about reframing it, and actually I think that um, and maybe I I don't I don't I you know I've, I've come as a new member Labour member of Parliament, and I haven't necessarily I wasn't involved in, in in writing this in any way, but I think the 2017 Labour manifesto um, reframes this beautifully because it sets the ambition of the United Kingdom having the healthiest children in the world, and because we know that the the roots of so many physical and mental health problems, the seeds of those problems are sown in <coughs> childhood. I think, um, and there is huge public support for investment in our children. I think that is the, the reframing leap that we need to make in order to get the resources that we need in order to get this strategic shift into prevention. I also think that it, as we break down barriers between out-of-hospital care and in-hospital care, we will find that the financial incentives become more aligned towards paying for prevention, which is almost always more cost effective than paying for the failure of prevention, which our current tariff system supports. So that will, that will be an enabler as well, but it's reframing it in terms of the healthiest children in the world that, that enables us to get the public support for the money that we need in order to do all of the things that we, that we know that we can do, particularly in childhood, to make sure that we, we, we sow the seeds of healthy lives. Okay, well, we've got uh, a good 10 minutes left for some uh, super awkward final questions, if anybody out there has got any burning on there. So we've got uh, one down here, Lizzie. I hope you're wearing a pedometer. You know, we're, we're really, it's all, all good preventative health. Hello. Um, you made a lot of very sensible points about the uh, difficulties, very practical. But if you look at the Brexit decision, it takes place at a much higher layer in our society, the Westminster bubble. And um, if you look at, say, the Andrew Marr show or Newsnight, none of the things that you talk about today have been mentioned, are going to be mentioned, will ever, ever be mentioned in the future. So how, how does your level impact or get to have an impact on the, on the decision-making level? That's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, let's take the next one. Uh, there's a gentleman down here has a question. Hi, just a question to all about um, air quality. And if you're not in an international framework which you sign up to on air quality, um, when the government breaches that, uh, as is currently the case with, with the EU, uh, charities and bodies can take a legal action on that for having broken agreements. If we are outside uh, such a, uh, an automatic framework, how do we ensure that standards are set which the government can actually legally be held to? 
Okay, and is there anyone else wants to get in finally as a last point? This is this probably be your last chance to ask the question. No? Okay. Um, uh, Paul, on, on that last point, I think it's a, it's a really good point. We've seen the government, uh, I think, is it three times now, hauled to court to be told their air quality measures are unlawful. Um, how, how do we make sure government is held to account in the future? I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, it's not an area that I've got any expertise in. I'd probably be coming to you to, uh, to ask you the, um, the answer to that question, but no, I, I honestly I don't know. I mean, John, I would yeah. assume uh, when laws are passed, uh, obviously as all citizens we have the right to go to the court and, def and hold them to account in that way, but laws can be changed just like that, can't they? So. Oh, I don't know, can they? Assuming, um, assuming they can get the MPs to vote for them, of course. I, I think air quality is a really interesting case study for, uh, for, for Brexit um, because um, the European standards, particularly on particulates, uh, are, half, uh, are twice the levels uh, of the World Health Organization. Um, and that was particularly from <coughs> lobbying from Volkswagen and Fiat. Um, and, um, but that's a different question, isn't it? That's the standard. Um, and we're not even hitting this standard that's half as difficult as the uh, WHO one. So we are obliged then to use the, the, the legal routes that we've got. Um, and, um, you know, the... Uh, you know, this is where, if we're outside of Europe, um, it's difficult to know just what what tests we, we will be able to use. Uh, and of course, everything we breathe uh, lands in Paris next day. So uh, whether there will be international incidents with uh, uh, EU versus UK afterwards, I don't. I don't know. I re you know, we really need assistance. raises the question generally that goes beyond this in terms of the environmental law and the real concerns of environmental law colleagues of the race to the bottom, potentially, mm. Mm. in terms of that whole area really post Brexit <coughs> as well. Um, I also wanted to pick up on I think the question of really over how almost that point about us this area not getting that sort of impact in a way. Um, and I sort of come back to in uh, the Cinderella concept in a sense, in a way that this has been such an integral part for the EU public health has in terms of framing and structuring responses to health. that's played such an important role. Uh, and yes, you're absolutely right in terms of the whole debate. It has not really been there as much at all. The Secretary of State for Health has come in occasionally uh, during the uh, last few months in, in terms of so if you go back to, say, I think it was July last year, um, him and Greg Clark's statement in relation to the impacts on pharmaceuticals uh, and access to drugs, etc. Um, he's also, as well, has come out in terms of some statements around patients and professionals, I think, in evidence to you in the Select Committee. But overall, I think, at the point earlier today, <coughs> the Secretary of State does not have the chair of the committee that's looking at these things in, ter in terms of a cabinet level. Um, and that public health itself is not necessarily seen in, in quite the way. I, mean, I think there's a really interesting question, actually, of whether, because we've alluded to this, are, the, the status of this post the Health and Social Care Act, and with so many public health powers as well being given to local authorities as well. Now, of course, we know otherwise why that was done. Um, now, that doesn't mean that, that local authorities don't have a role, but nonetheless, in terms of then visibility of raising that as well, rather than something necessarily always been automatically landing on Jeremy Hunt's door, doorstep. Um, again, I think there are practical problems. So I think there are problems in terms of perception generally, and, and there is a, it, it almost goes against the EU itself, because I mean, the EU's approach has been you know, a high level of protection for public health and the importance of it. Uh, at domestic level, but there again, at domestic level, we've probably never <coughs> given public health quite the importance it has until something really goes badly wrong, at which point we desperately rush to people like John to get things sorted. I think that, that would be the, the burden of my answer, really. I mean, do, we, do we need to wait for the next big disaster to, to get on the Andrew Marr show? Um, it seems to me the, um, you know, we, we have this issue of air, air quality at the moment, 40,000 deaths a year. Um, if it was in the water, that would be, you know, that would be everywhere. That would be, you know, if we'd killed 40,000 people through our water supplies, there'd, there'd be national uh, 
hell to pay and, and lots of publicity. Um, we have a national epidemic of drug-related deaths at the moment, which is uh, a complete scandal of uh, <coughs> failure of policy and services. Um, we have uh, a, r a range of these, these issues that come up as things that people instantly recognise are really important to their health, uh, much more so than, uh, you know, um, their summer holiday in the Costa Brava. But, uh, you know, uh, and, and as Paul said, you know, the, the, we, we all care passionately about the health of our newborns and our, um, our, our under fives, and yet we're in the, the, the bottom half of the league on deaths of children under five, which is a national scandal. So um, I think there's something in, in what it, that very fundamental question about how, you know, if we're doing all right, we get uh, we don't get noticed. It has to be something um, disastrous that, that that gets us noticed. And uh, certainly in my efforts, I'm I'm trying to get a more middle ground where we get noticed for things that are good or bad, and we do something about them. Paul, can I bring you in on that yeah. chap's question? As I think it was a really good point around the technical, the technicalities of a lot of Brexit, which nobody ever saw before the referendum. And it's probably a failure of my industry and the media as well for not talking about some of the specifics of that, but maybe we didn't understand it either. But well, I'd say we've all got a responsibility here. The public um, love the NHS, um, and the NHS is you know, one of the issues that is the most important to, to the public. We also know that Brexit is the, the biggest political issue of our time. But at the moment, in p most people's minds, they are not linking the two. And because the public aren't linking the two, it means that many politicians who follow the public aren't making that link. And it means that much of the media aren't making that link. And actually, you're all here because you've made that link. You can see that the impact of, the, of Brexit on the NHS and our health service is there. And whether or not you believe it is a positive or a negative impact, you can see the connection. And I think all of us, and it's why I've come here today, because I can see the connection, and I think it's an absolutely crucial connection. I want to tell that story. But I, uh, if, you, if you know Mr. Ma, or if you're able to get an invitation to me to go on to Newsnight, I would very gladly go and talk about these things there. But in the meantime, you know, we all have social media. People power can, can be a really, really powerful tool, and I think that... All of us in, the in this room have a responsibility to do as much as we can to, to tell this story to make sure that we are <laughs> linking Brexit and the NHS in people's minds. Excellent.